Religion is the chief instrument for the establishment of order in the world and of tranquility amongst its peoples, Baha'u'llah. God has created in man the power of reason whereby man is enabled to investigate reality. God has not intended man to blindly imitate his fathers and ancestors. He has endowed him with mind or the faculty of reasoning by the exercise of which he is to investigate and discover the truth and that which he finds real and true he must accept. He must not be an imitator or blind follower of any soul. He must not rely implicitly upon the opinion of any man without investigation. Nay, each soul must seek intelligently and independently, arriving at a real conclusion and bound only by that reality. Consider what it is that singles man out from among created beings and makes of him a creature apart. Is it not his reasoning power, his intelligence? Shall he not make use of these in his study of religion? Abdul Baha. So today our speaker is Dr. Mikhail Sergeyev, and his topic is the concept of reason, the enlightenment philosophy compared with the Baha'i writings. Dr. Sergeyev uh, has a PhD in the philosophy of religion, and he's a historian of religion, a philosopher, and a writer. His main research topics are Baha'i philosophy, religion and art, and Russian thought. His books and articles have been published in many countries around the world. Dr. Sergeyev has taught as, at various universities and colleges in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. He's developed more than 20 university courses in the history of religion, philosophy, and modern art, including the author's courses, Holy War, Religion, Art, and the Apocalypse, and Life After Death. He works now as an adjunct professor at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and an affiliated professor at the United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. He's also a member of the faculty at the Wilmette Institute of the Baha'i National Spiritual Assembly of the United States, where he served as chair of the Department of Religion, Philosophy, and Theology. Dr. Sergeyev is the author of more than 200 scholarly, literary, journalistic articles published in Russian and American journals. He writes in Russian and English, and some of his articles have been translated into Polish and Japanese. He's the author and contributing editor of 13 books, including Theory of Religious Cycles, Tradition, Modernity, and the Baha'i Faith, and Russian Philosophy in the 21st Century, an anthology. And with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Sergeyev. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to give this talk, and thank you for this introduction, and a special thanks for <laughs> pronouncing my name correctly. Uh, but it does not really matter since, uh, as I always tell my students and my friends, you can pronounce it any way you like it. I go by my Russian nickname, Misha, e easy to remember. So anyway, uh, in the beginning of my talk, uh, I was asked to, uh, to introduce uh, the Baha'i faith uh, in case uh, uh, we have uh, here people in the audience or later, those who will watch this video later, uh, people who are not familiar with this religion. Um, so um, let me do that. Uh, briefly, and then I will move on to my talk. Uh, Baha'i faith is a modern religious movement. Uh, and uh, I think it is very important to emphasize modern. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, first of all, it means that it is not one of traditional religions. And the traditional religions are those that were conceived and developed before the European Enlightenment in the 17th and the 18th century. Traditional religions are, uh, as we all know, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, etc. Uh, but Baha'i faith is not a new religious movement. There is this uh, scholarly category, new religious movements. Uh, new religious movements are those uh, movements that were conceived uh, in the 20th and the, or in the 21st century. So modern, means a religion that started after the enlightenment, uh, but it is not new because um, it already evolved for about two centuries. Uh, the founding fathers of the Baha'i faith are the twin prophets, the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Uh, these are their uh, religious titles. The Bab means uh, the gate, Baha'u'llah means the glory of God. 
Uh, Baha'u'llah was born um, in 1917, in the 19th century, uh, sorry, 1817, in the 19th century, and died um, uh, in 1892. Uh, he went through series of exiles. Uh, he declared his prophetic mission in uh, 1860s, and uh, for the rest of his life, he devoted himself to writing uh, many of his tablets. Uh, after his death, um, the head of the movement um, was his eldest son, um, who is known by his religious name, uh, Abdul Baha, which means the servant of the glory. And he was the head of the movement from uh, uh, the moment of the passing, from the year of the passing of his father until his own death in 1921. Uh, his successor as the head of the movement was his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, uh, who died in 1957. And uh, uh, after that, uh, the supreme body of the Baha'i faith is uh, known as the Universal House of Justice. And the first uh, Universal House of Justice was elected democratically in 1960s. Now, every religion uh, has uh, some core idea um, around which everything else um, is centered. For Christianity, it is the idea of universal love. For Buddhism, it is the idea of selflessness. For the Baha'i faith, it is the idea of unity. Uh, Baha'is distinguish uh, three unities, the unity of God, the unity of religion, the unity of humanity. Uh, like uh, other traditional religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, Baha'is are monotheists, hence the, the idea of the unity of God, God is one. Uh, unlike uh, most of the religions in the world, Baha'is claim that uh, most world religions have the same foundation, namely the Holy Spirit, and therefore uh, they preach the unity of all religions. And uh, the most important unity for Baha'is is the unity of humanity, which is the ultimate goal of Baha'i revelation. Uh, the main principles of the faith uh, were enunciated by Abdul Baha, um, whom Baha'is call the center of the covenant or the master. Um, in Paris in 1911 or in America in 1912. And those principles, um, which I would compare to the Ten Commandments of Moses. So the uh, Ten Commandments uh, of Baha'u'llah are the oneness of humankind, universal peace upheld by a world government, independent investigation of truth, the common foundation of all religions, the essential harmony of science and religion, equality of men and women, elimination of prejudice of all kinds, universal compulsory education, a spiritual solution to the economic problem, and finally, a universal auxiliary language. Uh, so with this, let me move uh, to my presentation, and let me come back to the term modern. Uh, when uh, I teach my university students and we talk about modernity, I often ask them, what do, what do we mean by saying that we are modern people? What does it mean to be modern? And uh, although modernity is part of our life, most of my students actually uh, do not know how to answer this simple question. So what is modernity, historically speaking? It may come as a surprise that the word modern in its Latin form, modernus, was for the first time used in the fifth century to distinguish between the Christian, then Christian present, from the pagan past. Uh, as we may remember, um, Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire by the end of the fourth century. But then uh, in the beginning of the fifth century, it was conquered, Rome was conquered by uh, 
The barbarians saw Christians in order to distinguish them from um, the pagan civilization of Roman, the barbarians uh, started calling themselves modern. But the meaning of the term modern uh, changed over time. Um, in the 15th century and the 16th century, modern meant uh, part of the Renaissance movement. Uh, the Renaissance scholars uh, argued that uh, the preceding 1000 years uh, uh, was the decline of the Christian civilization. Christians were in sleep. Um, and therefore, you know, Renaissance means the awakening of the Christian spirit uh, by reconnecting it to uh, the glory of the past, uh, the glory of the ancient civilization. So then modernity, since the 15th and 16th century, became associated with the Renaissance. And finally, uh, since the 17th and the 18th century, the term modernity became associated specifically with the Enlightenment, with the Enlightenment movement uh, that started in Europe first, and then was extended uh, to other countries, including uh, America, the United States. So today uh, I will be talking uh, about the Enlightenment uh, philosophy in relation to uh, the Baha'i philosophy and theology. The Enlightenment philosophy is quite complex and multifaceted. And uh, usually I analyze it in terms of four concepts, reason, nature, liberty, and progress. Today, uh, I would like to focus uh, my discussion only to the concept of reason, uh, which is uh, probably the central uh, concept, um, not only in the Enlightenment philosophy, but also in the whole history of Western philosophy. Because when we say reason, uh, we may understand various things by that. So uh, the concept of reason. Uh, the concept of reason uh, in Western philosophical tradition goes back to uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, especially to Aristotle. And uh, before I talk about the Enlightenment, uh, I would like to uh, discuss a little bit uh, the Aristotelian understanding of reason. So please, uh, not to worry, I know that Aristotle is not the easiest guy to swallow, but I will uh, try to discuss Aristotelian philosophy without any uh, special philosophical terminology so that everyone can understand whether you um, had philosophical training or not. In uh, one of his earlier works, Aristotle develops the so-called 10 categories. Um, what was the intent of those categories? Uh, he was simply trying to see how we understand the world the world around us, the world of sense perception. So, um, and he uh, categorized this world into 10 basic ideas. Uh, the first idea or the first category was substance. So let me give you a concrete example of what he means by all those categories. So for example, here we have a chair. So the category of substance, by the category of substance, we mean this particular object, the chair. Then the second category, quantity, one chair, or the chair is one. The third category, qualification, the chair is brown. It has certain quality. Uh, next category, relative. The chair is lower than the table. Uh, next category, where the chair is in the room. Next category, when we bought the chair yesterday on sale. Next category, being in a position. The chair is upside down. Next category, having the chair has four legs. 
Next category, doing. The chair carries a heavy load and we have to lose weight. And finally, the 10th category is being affected. The chair collapses by the heavy load because we did not lose weight. Uh, so all those categories for Aristotle were supposed to describe the world as we know it. And the supreme among those categories was the category of substance. So substance is uh, not only the supreme uh, among 10 basic categories, but it is directly related to how Aristotle understood philosophy. According to Aristotle, philosophy should be a science about substances. Um, in other words, you know, moving on to our contemporary world, we have lots of sciences, physics, biology, chemistry, etc. cetera. Uh, so all those sciences um, study various aspects of the world. Uh, but uh, philosophy as the queen of sciences should study not various aspects, qualities, dimensions of the world, but the very substance of reality or the very essence of things. As Aristotle puts it, I quote, it will of substances that the philosopher must grasp the principles and the causes. So uh, since Aristotle, this understanding of philosophy as uh, the queen of sciences, or it would, uh, as it would later be called metaphysics, um, was firmly established and accepted without uh, much questioning uh, by uh, the whole tradition of Western philosophy up to the enlightenment. By the way, what is the origin of the word metaphysics? Uh, after Aristotle died, uh, his disciples and his followers collected all of his lectures. The fact is that Aristotle was a teacher first and foremost. He created his own teaching school, the Lyceum, and he liked uh, walking when he was uh, teaching to his disciples. That's why the school of Aristotle is known as peripatetics, you know, people who walk in Greek. So uh, he did not write books, but he had notes of his lectures. And uh, uh, after his death, the disciples collected his works. And um, after his book on physics, they placed his book on the so-called first philosophy. That's what Aristotle called um, this philosophy about essences of things. Uh, so hence the book uh, became to be known as metaphysics. Meta means after, the book that goes after physics. Uh, that is the original meaning of the word. But uh, uh, later in the history of philosophy, uh, the term metaphysics acquired the meaning uh, that Aristotle set up for his first philosophy. In other words, metaphysics is that branch of philosophy, and it is the most important branch of philosophy, that penetrates the essences of things. Not, uh, it does not study the things as they appear to us. That's what other sciences do. But philosophy studies the essence of things or things as they are by themselves. Aristotle sets up his definition of philosophy uh, and according to him, philosophy or first philosophy, I quote, is a science which investigates being as being and the attributes which belong to this in virtue of its own nature, end quote. This science studies the, the things uh, as they are, as I said, or in Aristotelian words, qua being. Um, and uh, this science, philosophy, uh, deals uh, chiefly with that which is primary and on which everything else depends. So for example, uh, going back to 
our chair, um, various scholars and scientists can point out that the chair has color, shape, size, uh, design, uh, physical um, structure, etc. But philosopher is not looking for all that. The philosopher is looking for what is known as the chairness of the chair or whatness of the chair or the essence of the chair by which the chair stops being the chair. Now, one of Bahá'í's philosophers, Yin Kluge, calls this uh, idea radical rationalism. Uh, one Russian friend of mine uh, called this idea metaphysical arrogance. The assumption that human beings and human reasoning uh, is so powerful that we can penetrate with our reason and rational capacity the essences of things. And that idea of philosophy uh, was transmitted to the Enlightenment thinkers. And in fact, this idea of understanding human reason became the foundation uh, of uh, modern rationalism. The founder of modern rationalism was a French philosopher, René Descartes. And uh, modern rationalism, uh, in spite of many differences that Descartes has with Aristotle, you know, uh, Descartes changed many things, uh, many ideas uh, in Aristotelian science, especially. But in spite of all these uh, changes and differences, Descartes uh, retained the most important understanding of what philosophy is or of what philosophy should be. Uh, in his philosophy, Descartes postulates the autonomous and self-sufficient reason, human reason, that is capable to understand the essences of things. Uh, you uh, may remember Descartes' uh, famous formula, I think therefore I am. Even if you have not studied philosophy, you probably know about this formula. Uh, but uh, this formula, which in Latin uh, sounds like cogito ergo sum, is not complete. Uh, in his philosophy, Descartes begins with uh, doubt. Why? According to Descartes, philosophy is a science, like for Aristotle. And like all the sciences, philosophy uh, should start with some self-evident premises, which are called axioms, something that we cannot doubt. And uh, based on those premises, philosophy should develop its own foundations through a set of theorems like mathematics. You know, Descartes uh, was a great mathematician and he wanted to make philosophy as, um, as strong a science as mathematics. So uh, he starts his philosophy by trying to find something that could be certain, certainty of knowledge. And um, he uh, goes in various directions and finally realizes that there is nothing certain in this world because our sense perception can betray us. We can see mirages in the desert or hallucinations that our intuition, our tradition, our even our reason can betray us because we can make mistakes. Uh, so therefore, is there any certainty in the world? Is there anything in the world that could be relied upon 100%? And Descartes comes to the realization that the only certainty is that there is no certainty. Uh, and that to him is the infallible foundation of philosophy as science. Uh, hence the first premise, dubito, I doubt. But then he says to himself, what does it mean that I doubt everything? Uh, it means that I think, otherwise how else I could be doubting. So then I doubt, therefore I think. 
But what does it mean that I think? It means that I exist. Otherwise, who is thinking? Hence, his famous formula, dubito, ergo cogito, ergo sum. Uh, but what does it mean that I think? It means that I lack knowledge. And lacking something means imperfection. So the fact that I'm thinking means that I am imperfect. And what does it mean that I am imperfect? It means that there must exist perfection because imperfection can be understood only as contrasted uh, to perfection. So from the fact that I'm imperfect, I deduce that perfection exists. And Descartes says, that's what we call God. But if God exists, and God, by definition, is omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and um, uh, omniscient, then he would not betray me and present to me, offer to me this world uh, as an illusion. No, this world does exist because God uh, is fair. So it is in this tricky way, Descartes comes to... Uh, proving the existence of God and the reality of the world of perception. It is a very modern way because, uh, you know, scriptural philosophers in the Middle Ages, people like St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, would uh, start uh, from the existence of God, not from doubt, from faith and from the existence of God. But Descartes, as a modern philosophy, typical modern philosophy, starts with doubt as the only unshakable foundation of philosophy. Uh, but although his method is different, uh, his main premises of what philosophy is are the same. Philosophy number one is a science. And number two, uh, philosophy is based on reasoning that is autonomous and self-sufficient and that uh, could um, reveal the mysteries of the universe by itself. So in modern philosophy, uh, this traditional understanding of reason that goes back to Aristotle remained unchallenged um, up until uh, the Immanuel, the, the famous Immanuel Kant. Um, so Immanuel Kant was, uh, as far as I would say, the uh, only major Western philosopher that questioned uh, this idea of human reason and the possibility of scientific metaphysics. Uh, in our times, uh, Kantian uh, objections and Kantian philosophy has led to the crisis of philosophy in general. Because if you believe that philosophy is about metaphysics and uh, it should be a, a strict science, uh, and if you realize that this is impossible, philosophy loses its own subject matter. As a result of this crisis, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, many Western philosophers uh, actually rejected the very possibility of metaphysics uh, and um, proclaimed that philosophy should join its efforts with literature and with art. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, proposed different ways out of this philosophical crisis. And now, uh, let me connect uh, this, uh, th this discussion of uh, the idea of reason in the tradition of Western philosophy with the Baha'i approach to reason and rationalism. As I told, um, one of uh, Baha'i uh, philosophers, Yin Kluge, uh, calls the um, um, Aristotelian understanding of reason, an Aristotelian way of philosophizing, uh, radical rationalism. So if we accept this, and if we apply this also to modern rationalism, uh, we may say that Baha'i philosophy is based on moderate rationalism. And this moderate rationalism postulates the limitations of knowledge in general and human reasoning in particular, the so-called pure reason. I would say that uh, Abdu'l-Baha 
is uh, much closer to Immanuel Kant than to Aristotle, in spite of the fact that uh, Abdul Baha in his uh, uh, speeches and in his writings uses mostly Aristotelian language, Aristotelian philosophical terminology. Uh, but let us, uh, let us take a look at some answered questions. Um, some answered questions is, I believe, the main uh, work of Baha'i philosophy, the very foundational work of Baha'i philosophy. And here Abdul Baha says, I quote, know that there are two kinds of knowledge, the knowledge of the essence of a thing and the knowledge of its qualities. The essence of a thing is known through its qualities, otherwise it is unknown and hidden. Everything is known by its qualities and not by its essence. Uh, so here in one sentence, Abdul Baha basically rejects uh, the very notion that um, human reason is autonomous and self-sufficient and can penetrate the essences of things. He says that no, it cannot. And later he develops this thought by arguing that uh, we cannot know the essence of God. We cannot know the essence of nature around us. We cannot know, in fact, our own essence, the essence of human being. Um, but then Abdul Baha goes even further, you know, beyond Kant. The second limitation of knowledge. Hold on a second, let me make sure I uh, have all the quotations right. So the second uh, limitation of knowledge uh, refers to humanity's place in creation and the corresponding inability to know higher levels of existence. As Abdul Baha points out, I quote, the difference in degree is ever an obstacle to comprehension of the higher by the lower, the inferior. So we can understand the uh, lower uh, animal kingdom. We can understand the lower mineral kingdom, but we cannot understand the higher spiritual kingdom. And that is one of the reasons why we cannot fully understand life after death. The third limitation of knowledge, according to Abdul Baha, refers to the general liability of human cognition, including reasoning. Uh, Abdul Baha points out here that uh, uh, there are four criteria of human knowledge sense perception, reason, uh, intuition or inspiration, and tradition. Uh, all of them are liable to error. Um, not always, of course, uh, but we are not infallible uh, people as human beings. And therefore, uh, the only infallibility comes from uh, the Holy Spirit, revelation, and the manifestations of God. So uh, what is the conclusion uh, that I come in my brief discussion of uh, the, the concept of human reason uh, in the Western tradition uh, of philosophy, especially in the Enlightenment, and uh, in the Baha'i tradition of philosophical investigation? Uh, it seems to me that uh, Baha'i scriptures offer a totally different understanding of the nature, purpose, and scope of philosophy and philosophical inquiry. First of all, number one, philosophy is not a science. Uh, it originates not with doubt and se or self-evident truths like sciences, but it originates from faith and revelation. That's what Baha'u'llah tells us in his tablet of wisdom. And number two, uh, it is not the purpose of philosophy to investigate the essences of things. Uh, so uh, I told you that this Aristotelian approach uh, may be called metaphysical arrogance. So in Baha'i faith, this metaphysical arrogance 
is replaced by what I would call metaphysical humility or philosophical humility. Uh, I know that I know nothing. Uh, this is the beginning and the end uh, of all philosophy, as Baha'i scriptures tell us. Uh, and therefore, our philosophy as uh, the enterprise and wisdom, uh, in fact, uh, has very deep practical implication because the main purpose of philosophy is uh, to help us grow spiritually. So with this uh, uh, statement, I would probably uh, finish my talk and uh, I would open uh, the floor for uh, questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sergey. That was really interesting. Um, now, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and put it in chat. The first question is, isn't it true that we can't know the essence of anything? Look, um, I was talking about the essence of man, nature, and God. In other words, we cannot know the essence of things that were not created by us. But if we create something, if we, let's say, invent a computer, we know the essence of the computer because um, the level of computers is lower than the human level. Uh, so yes, we can make this distinction. Um, but, um, you know, traditional philosophy was not interested in uh, trying to find the essence of things we ourselves create. It's not the point. We would like to know the essence of things around us, things that were not created by us. And uh, the metaphysical project by Aristotle was that we are able to do that. Uh, and uh, that project, in fact, existed in Western philosophy for 2000 years, for more than 2000 years. Uh, it ended only in the 20th century and uh, contemporary Western philosophers are, uh, are in disarray. They do not know what to do. Uh, they, they simply do not realize that that was one uh, of the ways philosophy can uh, be developed. And there are many other ways. In fact, Eastern philosophy, Chinese uh, philosophy, you know, Buddhist philosophy, um, propose offer very different ways of um, developing philosophical thought um, as wisdom rather than as science. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I would be grateful if you could give more information about the Baha'i philosophy versus traditional philosophy versus metaphysics. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what does it mean more uh, information uh, because uh, as far as I know, and I'm trying to uh, follow all the new trends in Baha'i thought and uh, in Western uh, philosophy as well, although uh, obviously I do not have enough time for that. Um, but um, as far as I understand, Baha'i philosophy as well as Baha'i theology uh, now uh, are in the process of being developed. So far, um, Baha'is do not have philosophical schools or theological schools. Um, you may distinguish some trends within Baha'i thought. For example, there are Baha'is who are inclined uh, to uh, combine Baha'i uh, teachings with Platonism and Neoplatonism. There are other Baha'is who are trying to uh, make use of Kant and Kantian way of thought. Uh, in Baha'i philosophy. There are yet other Baha'is who are working with uh, analytical philosophy and are trying to, uh, you know, um, make, if not synthesis, but apply some tools of analytical philosophy to Baha'i thinking. Uh, but again, as, as I said, uh, at this point, uh, there are no movements or schools within Baha'i philosophy. Um, so therefore, the question is too broad. Uh, and uh, we have to wait for some time for those schools to arise. Uh, according to my idea of philosophy, not being a science, uh, there could be many schools of thought within Baha'i philosophy. 
uh, and they will not be necessarily competing schools. Uh, these will be schools that develop different trends of thought. And since uh, Baha'i philosophy, I think, is about wisdom, uh, you should not necessarily come to one correct view uh, about philosophy. And I think this will be an advantage um, because diversity, when uh, this diversity does not lead to, uh, obviously, to competition, strife, uh, etc., is uh, always helpful. Thank you. And a follow-up question to um, knowing the essence of things. Um, regarding the computer example, is there a distinction between knowing how it works and knowing its essence? Aristotle in uh, Metaphysics devoted uh, the whole chapter to the problem of substance. What is substance? And uh, he had four uh, solutions to the question about substance. Uh, it, it was only one of them that uh, the essence uh, of a thing constitutes its substance. Other solutions were matter um, and et, et cetera. So Aristotle, um, Aristotle was torn apart between um, the ideas by he, of his teacher Plato, who thought that real essences uh, do exist in a separate world. Uh, like uh, uh, the, the spirit, he, he, he compared the spiritual world, well, he could not because he did not know the computers, but we would compare the spiritual world to the template. And uh, this, this spiritual template has all those ideas or forms, adices, a, a, as Plato would say. And these were the essences uh, that uh, would reveal themselves in different proportions uh, in our material world. Aristotle um, was criticizing this idea and he thought that the true essences of things uh, could be revealed number one in definition, uh, but number two, simply by pointing out to uh, the object in question. For example, the essence of a chair is this particular chair or the way you define the chair. In other words, um, the uh, issue of the essences and what they constitute uh, is uh, one of the central problems in philosophy, uh, which I cannot exhaust uh, again in uh, five minutes or so. And plus we would go, we would go technical and I would try to avoid this. Thank you. What does it mean to know oneself in psychological or practical terms? And how might this relate to one's spiritual growth? What steps are involved in this process? Well, <laughs> that is a very serious question. And um, this is the question philosophers uh, keep investigating throughout the centuries. Um, we know that Socrates, said this and before Socrates, um, uh, the oracle at Delphi uh, said this, this is one of the sayings um, of the oracle at Delphi, know, know thyself. Uh, what does this mean? I can tell you uh, my understanding of what this could mean. Um, knowing yourself uh, means Number one, checking out your memories, because as Leo Tolstoy once said, uh, observe what you remember, and by what you remember and what you do not remember, you will know who you really are. Uh, memory is selective, and uh, uh, this selection is uh, happening unconsciously. And therefore, uh, based on what you remember and what you do not remember, you can actually see uh, the uh, depth of your own personality. Uh, this is my first practical advice. Uh, the second thing is that we know ourselves through our actions. And this is kind of obvious. Uh, if we want to help people and we are helping people, uh, this is one type of actions. 
if we want to become serial killers and kill people. This is another type of actions. Of course, these are extremes and we are always in the middle without killing anyone, hopefully. Uh, but uh, you know yourself by your actions and by the way your life uh, develops and progresses. And um, based on my experience, when you are young, uh, you seldom know yourself. In fact, uh, people around you know you, you, you know you better than you, you yourself. Uh, you discover yourself in the course of living your life. Um, and sometimes you can be surprised at who you are. Thank you. Faith is defined in the Baha'i teachings as first, conscious knowledge, and second, the practice of good deeds. Can it be said that philosophy is the acquiring of conscious knowledge? And how does one go about acquiring this? Again, personally, for me, uh, philosophy is about wisdom, uh, not about knowledge uh, per se, because um, uh, in this quote, uh, conscious knowledge obviously uh, meant the knowledge of faith. So you, you cannot become a Baha'i without knowing what this is about. <laughs> you have to know uh, the basic ideas, the basic teachings, the basic principles, the basic responsibilities, the basic, the basic duties. Um, but it does not mean that you, the more you know, formally speaking, the better you become. Uh, as Heraclitus told us long time ago, um, knowledge, knowing more, does not make you a sage, does not make you a wise person. Um, wisdom is about practical application of knowledge and life skills uh, in such a way as um, um, in such a way as doing everything in its proper time. That's what I would say. Because you may know a lot of things and you may go about this knowledge and uh, you know share it with everyone and this will not bring any fruits. Sometimes you should uh, sit and think and wait if you want to teach. I'm talking about teaching the faith. And wait uh, until the time comes. This is just one example. Wisdom comes with age. Uh, wisdom comes with experience. Uh, wisdom comes uh, from suffering. And uh, for me, this is the highest type of philosophy uh, that, that can be expressed uh, in paradoxes, uh, in poetic form, uh, not necessarily in analytic uh, uh, language of contemporary Anglo-American tradition. So logic is great as a tool, but logic will not help you uh, understand yourself fully. Another question is, can you comment on Thomas Nagel's paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Critiquing Materialistic Reductionism and the Limits to Our Ability to Understand the Essence of Other Beings. I cannot comment to this particular paper, but uh, I can comment on materialism in general and reductionism in general. Since um, I was born and raised in the Soviet Union, and uh, you know my uh, first education was uh, atheist and materialist. Uh, we studied uh, dialectical materialism and historical materialism, and I studied the history of religions uh, in the course titled uh, Scientific Atheism. Uh, when I came to the United States, I even brought with me this textbook uh, because I think uh, in 50 years, it will become a, a rarity. Um, those books uh, are not produced any longer. So I know a lot about materialism and atheism and reductionism. Uh, let me uh, tell you first, number one, uh, that uh, atheism and materialism um, are part of human intellectual heritage. Uh, they are as, as old as uh, philosophy. 
um, uh, uh, atheist and materialist schools of philosophy exist in all parts of existed in all parts of the world. Um, Charvaka in Indian philosophy, for example, uh, it existed in uh, Greek philosophy, um, Democrit, and uh, in Roman philosophy. Uh, it existed in Chinese philosophy, late Taoism. It existed in uh, uh, the Enlightenment philosophy, which was uh, critical of religion, uh, but often uh, agnostic and atheist. Uh, and finally, I would say it found its culmination in the Soviet dialectical and historical materialism. Um, so since it existed for such a long time, the basic premises of materialism are the same. If you look at Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, you know, uh, Hellenistic philosophy or Enlightenment philosophy, uh, there is one basic premise or they would probably call it the axiom on which the whole foundation of uh, atheism and materialism uh, is um, based. And this axiom is very uh, simple. Uh, only this world exists. Only the world of appearances exists. That's it. Um, now, uh, when I was studying uh, materialism in the Soviet Union, I was told that um, uh, this could be proven. I don't think it could be proven. Um, this is simply a, um, how shall I put it, a worldview that people choose uh, because um, it seems natural, uh, because uh, our sense perception is limited to this material world. And this is everything, this is all that we see, hear, touch, smell, etc. So it is natural to assume that this is what it is. Uh, in order to come from this um, axiom to another axiom that there are other worlds, uh, you need a lot of imagination, scientific training, uh, you need the uh, spiritual awakening, et cetera, et cetera. But na the natural view is the view of materialism. Uh, what about reductionism? Reductionism is that philosophy that is trying to reduce uh, all of human uh, emotions uh, and uh, states of consciousness and mental states and everything in our intellectual life to uh, the work of the matter. So for example, um, a contemporary movement of transhumanism, uh, the representatives of that, of that movement are trying to uh, enhance human life, uh, prolong human life, uh, hopefully indefinitely, and um, uh, they want to do it by creating a supercomputer uh, that would uh, uh, equal the working of the human brain. Now, this very idea of the possibility of this enterprise is based on reductionism, philosophical reductionism, that we can reduce, again, our consciousness, uh, mental activity, etc to the workings of our brain. And it is based on uh, the theory of John Locke, the founder of uh, uh, British empiricism and the, fo the founder of modern liberalism, a British philosopher of the 17th century, who proposed his famous theory uh, of blank slate, that we are born tabula rasa in Latin, that we are born with no preconceived notions, and uh, all the information, all the theories, everything that we acquire, we acquire from our environment. Um, now, this theory of psychological development is called uh, uh, psychological continuity theory. Uh, it says that um, our psyche is, does not equal our body, by the way, it is not the ultimate reductionism, because in the Soviet Union, I was taught that uh, my thoughts 
uh, can be reduced to the workings of the atoms in my body. Uh, now, this reductionism actually is disproven by science because we know that every seven years, our body is completely recycled. Um, and therefore, if every seven years, materially speaking, we are a different person, but at the same time, we uh, retain our sense of continuity in consciousness and self-consciousness. That means that you cannot reduce self-consciousness merely to our body. Uh, so therefore, uh, the uh, followers of John Locke, people like uh, Ray Kurzweil, the, the great American inventor and writer whom I admire, who is in his 60s and uh, who is taking every precaution in order to stay alive until it will be possible to become immortal. <laughs> if you have not uh, seen his interviews, I highly recommend the guy. The guy is obviously a genius. And as all geniuses, he's crazy. Uh, he takes about 250 vitamins per day. Uh, and he does all possible medical tests. He claims that his body is uh, strong and uh, is working as if he is in his 40s while in, he is in his 60s. Anyway, he's heading for a big disappointment, but uh, his idea of this psychological continuity theory is that um, our psyche, uh, having emerged from the workings of the brain, uh, becomes uh, relatively independent of the brain. So he sees the brain as the biological platform for our self. Uh, and he believes that it is possible to develop a different platform, technological platform, and uh, transfer uh, your psychological self into a technological platform. And in this way, you know, uh, humans will be able to prolong their life indefinitely. Uh, this is a, uh, a reductionism that is very popular uh, in, um, uh, you know, among people who are working with artificial intelligence, uh, because this is their working hypothesis, that what we call human soul uh, cannot be totally reduced to the body. It is, it is relatively independent, but it is still part of the body. And this is a very interesting issue uh, because um, so far we do not have any scientific proofs or disproofs of that. Uh, but if we consider those issues from a philosophical perspective, let me make a series of comments. Number one, uh, let's say um, medicine has advanced in such a way that um, they devised an artificial brain. It is, I think it is possible. So um, they devised an artificial heart. Uh, so they can perform heart transplant. They can perform liver transplant. Why couldn't they perform brain transplant? But this brain transplant will be such that the artificial brain will store all the memories, all the emotions, all the thoughts and everything else, including self-consciousness that I do have in my own brain. And suppose the person uh, suffered a car crash, uh, his brain dead, uh, and he undergoes an artificial brain trans transplantation, transplant. Would it be the same person? or would it not be the same person? This is a philosophical issue. This is not a scientific issue. This is a philosophical issue because it depends on how you see uh, and how you consider uh, what philosophers call the soul or the spirit or what the scientists call the self. If you believe that the self is not material, that would be one solution. If you believe that the self is material, but relatively independent of your brain, it would be a different solution. 
um, I think at some point science will be able to either prove or disprove one or the other. Uh, but at this point, we may simply speculate. Uh, but let me say that even now, when medical science has advanced tremendously, there is no machine that can register uh, the existence of self-consciousness. So if you are in a hospital, and if you are, you know, imitating, simulating um, the, the absence of self-consciousness, the only way the doctor could actually uh, say whether you are conscious or not is to ask you. There is no machine that could register whether you are self-aware or not, which means that we still have no idea uh, of what consciousness and more specifically self-consciousness is. And unless we know that, whatever we say uh, would be about speculation. Um, of course, as a Baha'i, I believe that um, uh, our soul or our self-consciousness is a spiritual uh, entity. And I believe that our brain, it does not generate thoughts, but um, transmits thought. Uh, our brain is a transmitter uh, by which um, myself is connected with my body. Uh, but this is, this is a belief. This is not a fact. Sorry for speaking too long, but this is one of those topics that uh, yeah, uh, are of high interest to me. Yes, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, so the previous question was actually, why does the word metaphysics include the word physics in it? Yes, uh, because um, when uh, the disciples of Aristotle were compiling all his works, uh, Aristotle had a book on physics. Aristotle was a universal mind. He had a book on everything. Uh, and by the way, he also wrote poetry uh, and novels, um, you know, you name it, uh, he did it. Uh, so uh, it so happened that after he, Aristotle's book on physics, they placed the book on first philosophy. That's how Aristotle called philosophy. Uh, philosophy. And uh, you know, the commentators, of uh, those works started to call first philosophy metaphysics because meta in Greek means after the book that goes after the book of physics. Uh, so hence this discipline became known as metaphysics. Interesting, thank you. Next question is how and when did you become a Baha'i? Oh boy. Uh, this is a question that requires uh, a separate <laughs> a separate talk uh, because I do not believe in sudden conversions, frankly. Um, I do not believe that people who were communists yesterday uh, would become religious, whether Orthodox Christian or Baha'i or anything else uh, next day. Um, conversion, I don't like the word conversion, uh, changing worldviews requires hard work and long years. That's my belief. And that's what happens to me. Um, it, it so happens that I was born and raised in the Soviet Union and I never knew um, anything about religion. And I was an atheist uh, by uh, I was an atheist by education, I should put it this way. I, I belong to the third, um, to the third generation of uh, Soviet people. Um, and I think this is a unique generation in world history because uh, there were no people like us, people uh, who did not have any religious tradition. So we, we have nothing to come to. Um, my grandparents, they were not atheists, but they were not religious. They were secular people. My parents were secular people. Um, so uh, the whole environment, um, educational school environment, university environment, family environment, 
um, uh, all of this was secular. Uh, and of course, uh, the communist ide ideology uh, promoted atheism, which is the militant form of secularism. Uh, so my, um, my mind was firmly cemented against any uh, ideas of spirituality and spiritual world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, the change um, started uh, when I was 24 years old. Uh, and this change was due to the fact that uh, I uh, realized uh, that uh, the communist teaching uh, is, is false. I had a friend of mine, one of my teachers. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, Marxism and Leninism. And um, after years of talk and reading, he convinced me that uh, Marxism is simply a wrong social teaching. And when I realized that, uh, I also realized that uh, Marxism served not only as a scientific theory, not only as a social teaching, but also as a substitute of religion for me, because relig the, the main purpose of religion is to offer meaning to a human being, the meaning of life. So the meaning of my life was to fight for uh, the better humanity on a global scale. Um, and when uh, this whole worldview collapsed, uh, then I realized that I have to find something uh, that would uh, give my life meaning again. Because human beings cannot live by, uh, uh, by food alone, by money alone, etc. Uh, but it was very difficult because the more I learned, the more I realized that uh, now this is not the case. Now this is wrong. Now this is not wrong. This is not right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it took me thirty years um, of studying religions, studying various ideologies, thinking about various philosophies, studying. Uh, ancient philosophy, studying modern philosophy, teaching for 30 years at the university, talking to my students, etc. So it took me 30 years to become convinced uh, that uh, Baha'i faith actually answers not only my concerns, but the problems of the world. Um, so that is a very, very, very brief response. Uh, to how this uh, happened. Thank you very much. And are there many Baha'is in Russia? Um, look, uh, Baha'is keep a very low profile in Russia uh, because the situation in Russia is uh, dangerous again. Well, let me remind you, if you don't know, that Russia was one of the countries that played a very important role in the um, first phase of Baha'i developments. Uh, the first translation into a foreign language of the Most Holy Book was done in Russia by a Russian person, Russian scholar. Um, a Russian Tsar offered um, an exile to Baha'u'llah. Um, Leo Tolstoy, the greatest of Russian writers, uh, was very interested in uh, this new religion and exchanged letters with Abdul Baha. Also, also he wanted to write a book about Baha'i faith. And um, the, the first temple, Baha'i temple, was built in the Russian Empire, in Ashgabat. Um, so the first uh, Baha'i communities in Russia date back to the beginning of the 20th century. But then uh, communism took over, and the communists uh, destroyed uh, all religions, old and new, the traditional and modern. Uh, and therefore, uh, there was nothing left of the Baha'i community. Many, many of those Baha'is were, uh, were from Iran, by the way. Uh, so there was nothing left um, uh, until uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Baha'i communities um, started uh, to be developed uh, all over Russia. 
but they are not uh, having big numbers. Uh, I would estimate about 10,000 Baha'is in Russia now. Uh, Russia has about 140 million people. Uh, but um, in the last 10 years, uh, Russian uh, legislation is becoming more and more um, authoritarian and punitive. And uh, various religions, uh, well, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses suffered because uh, uh, all of their property was confiscated uh, and they went to jail if they refused their faith. Um, now, according to this new legislation, uh, a person um, has an obligation to uh, perform religious rituals or do anything that is related to his or her religion only in the special places, like in synagogues or in mosques or in churches. So, for example, if you want to uh, create a study, a study group uh, to read the Bible, in your home, you may get uh, a jail sentence. So, so therefore, uh, and the situation uh, becomes more and more oppressive. Repressions uh, are getting tougher and tougher, culminating in the war in Ukraine. Uh, now you can get up to 15 years in jail for making a repost on Facebook. So basically, there is no law, there is no recourse to law. And therefore, Baha'is who are still there legally, who are still operating legally, are keeping an extremely low profile. And they are doing this by uh, officially announcing, and this is the official announcing uh, announcement on their website, and uh, um, that was officially uh, written during their registration. Uh, with the state that Baha'i faith is not engaged in any kind of proselytizing activity. Uh, so, so far th they were successful. I uh, have connection with many Baha'is in Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, but it's, it's pretty tough there. Thank you. Um, I think Marx was opposed to religions because he saw religion as a source of conflict, but we see that atheism is not a solution either. What do you think Marx would have to say about the Baha'i faith today? I don't know about Marx. I think Marx um, was more interested in uh, exploitation and stopping exploitation than religion. Yes, he saw religion as a tool of exploitation, um, because it may be the tool of exploitation, and it was the tool of exploitation uh, at some point in human history. The Russian Orthodox Church now um, is, is uh, supporting uh, Russian president in his war in Ukraine, for example. Uh, and uh, the Russian patriarch uh, drives in uh, Mercedes and uh, has a watch wristwatch that costs $2,500. Uh, so religion can have negative uh, uh, aspects. Um, so um, I have no idea what Marx would have said about Baha'i faith because Marx was talking about old religions or traditional religions. And um, he accused them of being the, opium, or the opiate of the people because he saw corruption in those systems. Uh, he never considered new religious systems. And uh, when Marx, Marx was alive, uh, you know, the Baha'i faith was just beginning. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to imagine how his thought would change in the 21st century, because so many things changed. Uh, first of all, Marxism uh, showed itself uh, as an ideology that leads to totalitarianism. Second, uh, capitalist societies were able to adapt uh, some of Marx's uh, recipes against exploitation. For example, Marx was the first one uh, to um, uh, promote the idea of public schools and public education. Uh, that was accepted 
in capitalist society as well as many other things. Um, and finally, uh, there are so many new religious movements um, that shows that religion is not simply about exploitation, that there are some other functions of religion that have nothing to do with economics. And um, the, main, the most important function of religion, uh, in my view, is uh, in the fact that humans are thrown in the middle of life uh, without knowing the beginnings and the ends. Um, so uh, we, we do not know what will happen to us after we die, but we know that we will die. Uh, and that very situation creates a psychological anxiety. It is a deep-seated anxiety that cannot be resolved uh, by uh, class struggle or the absence of class struggle. Uh, there are certain anxieties that are existential. And neither science, nor philosophy, uh, nor art, nor other spheres of human activity could actually release that anxiety. Only religion can. And that's why religion will never cease to exist. I think Marx was a smart guy, and I think he would have realized that. Thank you. Interesting. And could you briefly comment on Tolstoy and the Baha'i faith? Yes, Leo Tolstoy uh, was a universal mind uh, who was not only a writer. In fact, uh, in the second part of his career, he rejected all his writings as simply uh, a vanity project. Um, and uh, after um, he turned 50, around the time when he was 50 years old, he went through a spiritual crisis. Uh, he was tormented by the fear of death. In fact, he was tormented by the fear of death since his childhood because his brother, I don't rem remember whether older or younger brother, uh, died very young. Uh, and Tolstoy um, was tormented by the fear of death. Uh, in his 50s, uh, he went into such, a, such depression that he almost committed suicide. Um, he was able to overcome this crisis by uh, turning to religion. So as a person of great means, he started to learn. He learned Latin and Old Greek. He read the, uh, and Hebrew, by the way. Uh, he read the Bible in, in its original languages. He produced some theological works uh, in which he was trying to um, understand the essence of Christianity. Uh, he thought that uh, the essence of Christianity was the same uh, as the essence of all religions. He started to study world religions. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, some popular books uh, about you know, uh, those religions, Hinduism, Taoism, etc. So he was very interested in interreligious dialogue. But since his Christianity, he became an Orthodox Christian, he was baptized. But uh, his Christianity was not Orthodox by any means. Uh, he was a very critically minded individual, criticized the Orthodox Church, and um, um, his conflict ended with his excommunication from the Orthodox Church. Um, so he created his own brand of Christianity, the so-called Tolstoyan communities uh, in which he preached nonviolence. He thought that the essence of Christianity is about nonviolence. Do not return uh, evil for evil. And those Tolstoyan communities uh, spread around the world and uh, later influenced uh, Mahatma Gandhi in his quest for India's independence. And the, the Tolstoy's second great influence was Martin Luther King. Uh, who, who was greatly influenced by Tolstoy uh, in his crusade for equality in the United States, for racial equality in the United States. But uh, the, um, the driver of Tolstoy's interest in Baha'i faith was that he was interest, interested in religion, generally speaking, in the second part of his life. And um, when he got the news about uh, the Bobby movement, he actually knew about uh, the Bab. And after that, uh, he came to know about uh, Baha'u'llah. Uh, so he started his correspondence with Abdu'l-Baha. 
Um, and um, also he's reported to have said that he wanted to write a book uh, about uh, Baha'u'llah. There is a book in English that is called uh, Tolstoy, uh, Leo Tolstoy and the Baha'i Faith. Uh, but that's about it. He died. He was an old man. Thank you. Um, looks like that's all the time we have today, but thank you so much again to Dr. Sergey. Very, very interesting talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. And our speaker next week will be Dr. Giuseppe Robiati, and his topic is, is a world order necessary? So these talks, again, are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And I've put the link to our contact form in the chat if you'd like to join our mailing list. And we'll end today with a Baha'i song. side